Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, staying to the bitter end. Um, I'm going to tell you a good news story, and I think also the last uh, presentation, the video, is a great segue into this as well, because uh, it's talking about how do we make an offer to students that are coming through the pipeline that oil and gas and the wider geoscience community, geoscience training, is attractive, and there are good jobs to be had in this particular area. So I'm going to talk to you about the UK Centre of Doctoral Training, the CDT in oil and gas. Uh, it is also the end, if you like, of that, that story that Mark started with schools going to undergraduate degrees. This is about doctoral training. This is about PhD students. So I'm going to take you back to August 2013. Uh, I'd just moved from Edinburgh to Heriot Watt, one day in the job, and NERC announced that there was going to be a centre of doctoral training for three years of input of 10 students each year, 30 students, a £3 million programme. The call was uh, a competitive one, so a number of universities uh, had to start working together to build uh, a, a, an offer to the NERC, not something that we've been used to doing. Many universities very siloed and actually competitive over research funds and the like and undergraduates coming in. So the call was in, in the form of a competitive tender. Um, what I, uh, I should also say, deadlines are really short. We were given a month to get together in August, get together the, uh, announce the uh, expression of interest, and then one month later put in a full bid. So um, we were given four themes that we had to address. Effective production of unconventionals. You remember 2013, that was the time when shale gas started to really uh, be talked about around the kitchen tables here in, in, uh, in the UK. Extending the life of mature basins. And I'll, I'll talk more about that later, about how we interpret extending the life of mature basins. There are many ways to extend the life of the North Sea and other areas. Challenging environments, that's anything from uh, exploring in the Arctic to high pressure, high temperature. You can interpret a lot of things there. And the fourth theme, which I think is really important, is about environmental regulation and impact, the social license to operate. And the backdrop to this as well was that you see here from 2007 to 2013, the hump of those coming towards the end of their career, moving towards the right-hand side of this age group at the bottom. And you can see behind it, there's, there's a dearth of numbers. And actually, what happened from 2013, immediately after, the oil price went south. So actually, the, the skill set and the numbers of people with the right training and technical skill set was diminished. So we actually, in a way, were, were filling, uh, although this was set up before that oil price uh, crashed, this was coming along the, 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 the line. So what we did was to build uh, a partnership of seven universities. In fact, six universities and the BGS were core partners. And we agreed to put in two studentships to only take one out from the central pool. And what I was really keen to do was to extend the offer across the UK to other universities that wanted to join us with a skill set in geoscience. So places like Royal Holloway, Basin Dynamics, places like Birmingham with micropaleontology, Newcastle with geochemistry and so on, make the offer so that they would come with us. And indeed, we had another 16 universities uh, in total. Uh, it, it, so here are another 11 universities plus the other six, 17 in total, and two research centers, the NOC, came with us as well. So we have a partnership which is across the country. The, the larger symbols are the core partners, the smaller ones are the associate partners. And the associates put in half a studentship to get half out, which enabled us to go from 10 studentships a year to 30, already having a, a, a gearing ratio uh, of one to three. What the vision was, and I believe we've delivered on, is to get a inclusive national collaborative center marrying research, world-class research and a training component. I remember when I was a PhD student, working away quietly, lonely in, a, in a, uh, 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 my own subject area, what was it that I would have liked? I would like to have a cohort of students that I could interact with, also know about the broader bandwidth of the subject that I'm doing. And so what I wanted to do was to build a training program that went alongside the research and brought those students together. So we've got a bespoke thematic training program of 20 weeks, uh, which is spread out over the first three years of a four-year PhD program. Uh, what we wanted to do as well is, of course, attract the best talent. And these would be folk that would then subsequently go on to be the legacy of geoscientists that go into oil and gas, 
go into government, go into academia, and go into policy making. Wanted to place student experience right at the heart of this, so you'll see some of the feedback mechanisms. Also wanted to empower students to manage their own projects, and particularly the finance of their own projects. Previously, universities uh, would get uh, what's called an RTSG, which is uh, a research training and support grant, £5,000 a year for studentships. They didn't necessarily give it to the student to work on their particular project. They should have done. So I think it's really important that we make it clear to students that this money is there. It's for their purpose to work with the supervisors on how that's spent appropriately for the project that they're doing and their own development. And as I've said here, wanted to train the next generation of students. This was at this stage just an academic offer. So it could have been universities talking to universities. What I wanted to do then is go out and engage with industry. And I'm really grateful to both BP, Trevor Garlick in particular, uh, and Edwin van Donk from uh, Shell for making it possible to go into their offices and present this offer to a wider community. And of course, if, you, if BP give you the platform to do this, other companies think, there's something going on here. I'm going to turn up and listen to this. And uh, BP then came across the line and said they would like to provide financial support for the training program, as did Shell the following day, as did a number of other companies. So we now, this is the list of companies along our journey that have supported us, and we currently have eight companies, because of course there's been mergers and acquisitions and various decisions taken about divestment in the North Sea and so on. Uh, but these eight companies, and I notice here that four of them are represented on the, um, uh, the sponsorship for this particular program. So I'm very grateful to them. Um, they support the training academy that allows us to put on the 20 weeks that I, I said um, before. They also have engagement back in terms of the Industrial Advisory Board. In addition, other companies have stepped forward with software, with training courses, and I'm very grateful to those people like Mike Simmons and others who are in the audience here. Fantastic that they've given us their time, or companies at the base here that have given academic licenses or, 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 or seismic data and the like, so thank you for that. What are the numbers? Well, we have 128 students studying oil and gas PhDs across the 17 universities. 128 students that probably would not have been doing PhDs without the uh, CDT. You can see the gender balance here, and interestingly, perhaps for you, the first cohort from 2014 entry are now submitting the theses and going out into employment. 100% employment. 20 students have graduated from the first cohort, all have gone into employment, and one, Nick Ward, has gone to uh, Amazon as well recently. So, training. PhD research is often really, really focused. Our objective was to do something differently. The aim was to add value to a student's research uh, abilities by placing the wider bandwidth, so to introduce them to where their research sat in a, in a broader uh, context and hence try and make them more employable at the end of this as well. So the training academy is this 20 weeks and it goes from foundations and fundamentals in the first year, 10 weeks worth of compulsory courses, then it's five weeks in year two, five weeks in year three, which are optional and modular. As you see here in blue, I'm delighted that the JOLSOC stepped forward and said, this is a tremendous program, you meet all our criteria with 60 days of field work and so on, we accredit you. So now we can give a diploma to our students and that helps them in terms of CPD and, and, and the like uh, in their further employment. We have an annual postgraduate conference, the next one of which is here in Edinburgh on the 1st of November. Any of you want to come, please see me at the end. You'd be very welcome to join us. So part of this was to think about population growth is doing what it's doing. It is driving a number of behaviours, but one of the important things is that oil and gas demand is still there in 2050. We have to think how we are going to be sustainable, how we're looking after the planet, what do we need to do, which means that we're looking after that environmental regulation, getting the social license to operate. We're also looking at the backdrop of the conversion from coal to oil and more particularly to natural gas and some of the other disciplines. So what we've done in terms of extending the life of mature basins, interpreted that very liberally. And we've signed an MOU with the, the CDT and uh, CCS. We have a number of CCS projects. We have geothermal projects. We have projects in decommissioning. So we've been looking at how we expand our offer. 
We're also looking at the challenges. Some of you may remember CO2 storage was promoted in southern Holland at Berendrecht, and it led to uh, a pushback from the community. The social license wasn't there. So we've engaged with uh, folk to come from the NGOs and the like to talk to us and, and start to have that dialogue, because it's really important that we understand the, the tension between the communities and our students are aware that actually when they go out from the CDT, they may not be that popular. Here's the training pyramid, going from the essential through to the options from the base year one, 10 weeks of training, five in year two, five in year three, and the fourth year dedicated to the thesis and the thesis alone to, to submit. So we built a training academy of drop-down menus and, and people pieced together there with their supervisors and others what they wish to do to build that. Field training has been essential. So that we heard from the Industrial Advisory Board, this is the one area that sometimes companies find really hard to deliver themselves. And so if it was done at a front end at what we're doing, then that would be really good. And so we, that's what we've, we've attempted to do, to build in a very high standard of HSE, raise our own academic bar to ensure that we're doing it to the standard that an Exxon, an Exxon joined us recently, uh, would be uh, acceptable. The feedback is really important. We have a number of committees and we get the feedback from students. So not everything we deliver uh, is necessarily well received. Uh, can we improve? Yes, we can. So if we get a feedback mechanism, we can then start to change the offer that we make, the things that we put into the curriculum. What we've been doing is moving more and more to try and get some of the other disciplines on the periphery, if you like, of hardcore geoscience, but really important in this energy transition, so that we're thinking about economics, engineering, public engagement, outreach, governance, policy, regulation, legal, ethics. We had the head of the EU delegation who settled the dispute between um, uh, Cyprus and uh, neighboring countries who worked for Greece and, and the EU come and talk to it. I mean, that's what we're trying to do, to try and widen the experience for the students. Of course, the international-based research is crucial. So you see here a number of our students where they are. It gives the, 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 the platform. So there is a focus on the UKCS. This whole uh, process was set off by Bayes with a view to there is a dearth of talent and skill sets in this area in the UK, but you can see that there's been outreach to wider community. I wanted to separate the oil company support, which has gone towards the underpinning the training academy, from the PhDs themselves, so that the students would be visible, they could publish, they could present, and, and here you see a number of them doing this at international conferences and publishing widely. So actually, it's building a credibility of research as well across the piece. Finally, uh, a lot of uh, talented individuals on this course. So they're winning awards, uh, getting uh, recognition nationally and internationally. So very proud of what they're doing. But there's an interesting sideline here. Would I be sitting here as a member of the, or standing here as a member of the Scottish Science Advisory uh, Council advising ministers now? There was, wasn't anyone advising ministers on geoscience and energy in Scotland. I find that amazing, but I'm there. Uh, we have engaged, as you see here, with the Secretary of State of Scotland, the uh, UK energy minister at the time, Matt Hancock, uh, then the Scottish minister for energy and local MSPs and so on. So interestingly, this becomes a one-stop shop for people to come and find out and engage with students and find out some of the, the key issues in oil and gas. So it's been a really interesting uh, opportunity and journey for me because that sort of thing, uh, rightly or wrongly, a perception then is, is one of credibility and, and, and uh, critical mass, which has led to opportunities beyond my, uh, my expectation. We've also had a number of students go in and do internships across the piece. So Equinor in particular have been um, very, very keen on this. You can see 10 students went to do Equinor. ExxonMobil, even though uh, they weren't at the time uh, contributing to this, they took some of our students both in the UK and in Houston, and they were so impressed, they've now backfilled to come in and support this. But you can see it's not just that. People have gone into Scottish policy and government, gone into the BBC and other, other groups, including down there in uh, Australia into a CTS. So, just as I conclude here, um, what I also want to do with the mentoring scheme is to ensure that people who are young professionals in industry 
could engage with the students and vice versa. So we've tried to make it possible for uh, the students to understand and, and engage with those from industry. You can see in the bottom left, it's also uh, quite social, and in the bottom right, that was the CDT conference last year with 108 students in attendance. There'll be 128 in the program or finish the program uh, as I currently speak. What are we trying to do now? We're trying to place geoscience, first of all, at the heart of the debate about decarbonisation, the challenge of oil and gas. There is a recognition of the demand and need for these skills and the dearth, you heard it before, in terms of the pipeline of people coming through. There are specific skill sets that we think that we could start to develop in the decarbonisation decarbonization space. Geophysics in terms of induced seismicity, seal integrity for CO2 storage, uh, geothermal and uh, mineral exploration, lithium cobalt. Where are we going to get those minerals sustainably uh, without actually causing more environmental damage by mining the, the, the seas or uh, the lithium triangle or Congo with all the problems that come from there? I think we're as relevant now because of the skills and the geoscience at the core as we were five years ago in oil and gas. I put out a piece earlier, uh, or very recently actually, uh, early last month in the Geoscientist. I understand that Val is going to send that to all the delegates here. Uh, I would really encourage you to read this and then you know, give me a uh, pushback or, or challenge to what's written here. But I see the CDT as an opportunity and that segue into the community where we can start to train the geoscientists of the future in a decarbonized world using this model that I have just been describing. So what I hope I've been able to do over the short um, interlude really uh, is to say the Centre of Doctoral Training exists if you didn't know about it. Uh, I would argue it's been very highly, highly successful. Five years completed, 128 students recruited, 20 have now graduated into employment. We've built industry support at a time of uh, real challenge, oil price challenge and negativity uh, surrounding this particular phrase. Um, we've got good, uh, good uh, management, administrative structures. I pay tribute to Lorna Morrow, who's my uh, CDT manager, and Anna Clark, who runs the training program just uh, uh, superbly. The industrial partners have been fantastic in underpinning and allowing us to build the training program. The training program has allowed us to be accredited by the JOLSOC. Uh, as I say, the first PhD graduates are out in the workplace already. And I think we're building that strong research reputation aligned with training excellence. That's the CDT, and we're very happy to talk to you more about it. But please don't take my word for it. These are the quotes from the students themselves that have been on the program. And there's half a dozen here. Many of you will have interacted with them during the course of, of this uh, two days. Many of them are here. Please talk to them before um, the end of the, the session. And if any of you can come, if you want to, on the 1st of November, we're very happy to welcome you to the CDT conference itself. Thank you very much.